Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar. Allahu akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله العظيم من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أدى الأمانة وبلغ الرسالة ونصح للأمة وكشف الغمة وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك فعليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصب الحق وتواصب الصبر آمين رب العالمين وأصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله وقد أمرنا بالحق وقال تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم أما بعد We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by bearing witness that none has the right to be worshipped or unconditionally obeyed except for him and we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger we ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon him the prophets and messengers that came before him his family and his companions that served alongside of him and those that follow 
in their blessed example until the day of judgment and we ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, as you look throughout history and you look to those that were able to change the course of history and to influence change, a lot of times you look at the hero up front or you look at the villain up front, but you don't pay much attention to all of the elements that work behind the scenes. And sometimes those elements behind the scenes are intensely good and sometimes they're intensely evil but nonetheless they have the ability to change the course of history for good or for bad and Allah Azza wa Jal has put in us as human beings the potential to bring about enormous change be it for good or be it for evil and it's very powerful that when Adam السلام, the Prophet ﷺ described to us that moment when Adam السلام's descendants were put in front of him and he noticed that bright shining light in Dawood that one man that, that just shone, that stood out to him and Adam السلام, saw the benefit that he would bring not just his worship but that David Dawood السلام, would bring in terms of establishing on this earth that which was righteous and institutionalizing khayr, institutionalizing good with the kingdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him and Adam islam even dedicating or donating a few decades of his life to Dawood alayhi salam because he was so touched and so inspired by what would come out of his descendants that that one person shone and then there is also the capacity of one person to influence in an evil way. Sometimes that person is representative of an evil current in society that's going untreated. So sometimes that person is a manifestation of an untreated sickness in society, right? And that could be the president, that could be an influential uh, spokesperson for some, you know, for some political lobby or organization or group, that could be an influencer in, in sports and in culture, but that they are representatives of something that is far more evil in society. And that sickness has to get treated. But one thing is for sure, what we learn in the narration is that one person can light a community on fire or to allow, could allow that community to become torture bearers for communities that are around it and communities that will follow. It, it can often be just that one person. On one hand, الْفِتْنَةُ to نَائِمَ لَعْنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ إِيقَضَهَا Fitna is always asleep in a community. The possibility of disunity, the possibility of dissension, the possibility of things erupting is always a risk that even the community of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the most ideal community that ever existed, had to deal with. In their situation, the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. One man who could embroil the community of the Prophet ﷺ in controversy and could hinder the ability of that prophetic community to move forward. If you were to look at the progress that was made from the community of the Prophet ﷺ during Hadithatul Ifq, during the, 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 the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha and the things that Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul pushed for, started a trend, started a current with in society, then surely a community that was so important, not just to its own world, but to the world after it as well, surely that community would be paralyzed and struck because of that one fitna inside that stopped it from being able to give to the world as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tasked it to do. It took one person. One person starts to say some things. One person starts to pass a current. And the entire community is paralyzed of khair. Paralyzed of its goodness. That's why Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, يَعْمَلُ النَّمَامُ فِي سَاعَةٍ فِتْنَةَ أَشْهُرٍ he said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that a namam, a person who slanders, and namima is of two types. Namima is slander, but namima is also quoting people's words to each other, forwarding an email, 
So, saying that, you know, this person said this about you, and this person said this about you, and that person said this about you, forwarding one email, forwarding a text, passing words, stirring dispute, with the truth, with the truth, but with the intention of falsehood, with the truth. They're not telling any lies. They're truthful when they go and say, this person said this about you, that person said this about you. They're not lying. But it embroils the community, Ali radiallahu anhu said that in one hour, they cause a fitna that takes months to put out. It takes one tongue, one person to do all sorts of damage to a community. And then you've got the voices for goodness and the voices of khair. Now, I want you to imagine this image, to think of this image. When you have two parties fighting or you've got all sorts of controversy going on and you've got people going at it with one another, you know, just think about the, the, just the, the, the visual of the person that's in between trying to stop the fight. They're getting stepped on, they're getting hit from both sides. One side accuses them of being, you know, too soft on the other side. The other side says that you are actually, you know, part of that element because you're not willing to, to act with the same level of severity as our side. They just get caught in between and are completely underappreciated uncelebrated and usually that person that plays the role of islah the person of reconciling between the people is never celebrated because they're neither fully hero nor are they fully villain <laughs> they're just in between there and as history moves forward their role in bringing things together is usually completely unrecognized the cement between the bricks when the Prophet ﷺ described our community كالبنيان, that it's like a building and each part of it reinforces the other the cement that holds the bricks together is not seen, is not recognized and it takes one person sometimes to quell all of those elements to play that role now here's where the discussion gets a little tricky. There's the peacemaker, and then there's the voice of justice. Often, the peacemaker, in his desire for peace at any cost, allows for the truth to be obscured. And in wanting to avoid all sorts of conflict, avoids even necessary conflict. Because at the end of the day, they have conflated peace with the absence of tension that as long as we can remove tension from the public space, then that's what we need to have. And in that process, the truth is obscured. Then you have another person who considers themselves a voice for justice. You know, when you look through the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, everyone wants to be Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Everybody. Everyone wants to carry the stick of Umar, but no one wants to pray the qiyam of Umar. Everyone wants to make wrongdoers cry the way that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu made transgressors and oppressors shake in their boots, but no one wants to shake and cry the way that Umar did at the thought of his own transgressions and his own possible injustices. But everyone looks to the seerah and says, I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be the one that's going to make sure the truth is established. And conflates the call for justice with the call for perpetual conflict brings in conflict even when it's unnecessary. And when trying to fight one injustice actually brings more injustice. وَالْمُنْكَرْ لَا يُغَيِّرْ بِمُنْكَرْ And evil is not changed by evil. It becomes always this fight. And we've got to always be in controversy because the truth must prevail. But in reality, that is not about a cause. It's about an ego. It's about a person. It's not about the cause that's being articulated, it's about the voice that's articulating the cause. And a person gets too comfortable in that role, and in the process takes the community on a ride. So where do you find the balance between the voice for justice and truth, and the voice for peace and civility? How do you find that? Well, first of all, it's important for us to recognize that Allah has given us all very unique personalities, very unique capacities, very unique inclinations. We're a collection of our experiences. The things that we went through in life shape how we view life today. And as long as you can channel those experiences and those inclinations in a way 
that you are the most productive to your community, the most pleasing to Allah, and making that quality most in accordance with the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, you're doing well. The Prophet wasallam did not turn Abu Bakr into Umar, nor did he attempt to turn Umar into Abu Bakr. He made Abu Bakr anhu the best possible Abu Bakr he could be. And made Umar radiallahu anhu the best possible Umar he could be. And Uthman the best possible Uthman he could be. And Ali the best possible Ali he could be. You take that personality and you are very conscious and aware of the pitfalls of well-meaning, well-intended courses of action that you, you could take based upon those personality traits that you have. So yes, some people are going to inherently be more devoted to the justice of the, of, 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 of the situation than the peace of it. And some people will be more devoted to the peace rather than the element of justice in actually solving the underlying causes of, an, of a situation. But at the same time, the way that those two make sure that they don't fall out of bounds is by ensuring that the truth is never lost in what they do. The truth is not lost in the loudness of the voice for justice and the truth is not lost in the quiet of that voice for peace. The truth does not get obscured. And if you look at the Prophet ﷺ and how he was able to walk that fine line, it's beautiful. Two incidents before he received prophethood ﷺ. He knew when to employ both. The Prophet ﷺ was the youngest member to participate in Hilf al-Fudul, in the, in the coalition of virtue that would ensure that no person is taken advantage of on the basis of having a lower status in society. It was the injustice of one man to another man that didn't belong to the tribe of the Prophet ﷺ that drove the Prophet ﷺ and others to take a, a, a pledge, to take a pact. Now, that was a good tension that was forced. That was a good tension that was forced because status quo was unacceptable because the weak were constantly exploited. Those that did not belong to the more powerful tribes were, you know, had no protection whatsoever. So when that one man raised his voice and wrote a poem about Mecca and embarrassed and humiliated those tribes that were masquerading as, as, as noble tribes for the way that they were failing to protect the weak amongst them, it forced a societal change. And the Prophet ﷺ responded to that call. And he said that if I was to be called to it even after becoming a Prophet, I would still respond to that call. I would always come to that table. If it's going to protect one element of the vulnerable, I will come to that table. Even if it's believers, not believers, whoever it is, even as the Prophet of Allah, I will come to that table for that specific cause. But you know what? There's another element. So the Prophet ﷺ there responded to the tension and participated in a productive way in making sure that that healthy conflict led to a healthy resolution. We're not going to brush our problems under the rug again. We're going to come up with healthy solutions to this healthy conflict. Because if we don't, then the problems will only perpetuate. So we've got to do something about it. The Prophet some move forward. In another situation, the situation of the placing of the black stone, Al-Hajr al-Aswad, in the place of the Kaaba, where it was in the Kaaba. I want you to understand all the dimensions of this because it's profound. You have a bunch of tribes and they're hesitant as to who will put the black stone in the corner of the Kaaba, which at that time is occupied by idols, inside out, hundreds of idols. And one element of that idolatry is the self-worship that those tribes had that, well, which one of us is going to be the one that's going to put the stone forward? It's silly. It represents, it represents something lower about that society that that's even a thing. That I can't even trust the other tribe to pick up the stone and put it in the corner of the Kaaba because that's going to somehow give them leverage over my tribe. So they made the decision that whoever walks through the door next, that's the person that's going to do it. The Prophet some walked in they said, Al-Ameen, Radina. The trustworthy one has come. Radina. We are satisfied. When they said, the Prophet, the trustworthy one has come, 
What were they implicitly admitting about each other? <laughs> that they knew that none of them could trust one another. That none of them felt safe with one another. That they knew that every one of them had the agenda of superiority of tribes. So actually some of the ulama of Sirah say that's the first time the Prophet ﷺ was called Al-Ameen. The first time they actually used that nickname of the trustworthy. Al-Ameen, Radina. We're all pleased with him. Because we know he has no agenda. His agenda is the goodness of our community, the goodness of our society. That's a beautiful testimony of those people to the Prophet ﷺ. The irony is that one day the Prophet ﷺ will walk in that Kaaba and break stones. One day he will take down all their idols. But what is the moment called to? The Prophet ﷺ wants to address a specific ill. They say, Al-Ameen Radina. What's the solution of the Prophet ﷺ? He takes his own cloak, puts it on the ground says put the stone on the ground and let a representative of each tribe carry that cloak and then place the stone together the hikmah the wisdom of the prophet sallallahu in that moment now usually when you come to a peace agreement or a peace treaty no side is really satisfied because internally some people were hoping that the Prophet ﷺ was closer to them and that maybe he would say, well, this group of tribes, this tribe has been here longer. They do more khidmah to the people, more service to the people that come. But they knew the Prophet ﷺ had the best interests of the community at heart. Now the Prophet ﷺ could have taken that moment to say, what's wrong with you people in the first place fighting over who's going to put the stone? But he recognized the moment, that at that moment, the best thing to do was islah was to bring people together was to show people that it was possible to compromise amongst their tribes and continue continue what he was really moving towards of tawhid of monotheism and its implications which would be the eventual fall of all of those other 360 stones that were in and out the Kaaba but there was a moment there it took one man to solve a potential conflict that would have embroiled the Arabs for decades. That hikmah of the Prophet ﷺ, that wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ in those moments. Now, when the Prophet ﷺ did that, there probably would have been some younger people within some of those tribes that were looking at the Prophet ﷺ like, I can't believe he did that. Why couldn't he have done this? And why couldn't he have done that? But eventually, it was their voices that became irrelevant. At those moments, the voices would have been the loudest. Eventually, their voices became irrelevant and the Prophet ﷺ spared the Arabs of a major, major conflict. Let's get to that personality trait for a moment. The person who is always looking for the interests of the community and is trying to build, wants to be that cement. When people fall apart, people know that's a person of islah, that's a person who will reconcile between people. That's a person that will come together, that will put his own feelings, his own agendas on the side, his own interests on the side, his own name on the side, and will do what they can to sit people together and to move forward without losing the cause. Because that's the pitfall of that personality as well. Inna Allah yuhibbul muqsateen. When Allah talks about a situation arising amongst the community, and Allah talks about everyone coming together against a clear transgressor and trying to bring people together. Allah Azza Jal mentions at the end that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala loves those people that reconcile, that uphold justice. In a hadith in a Tabarani, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi called it "Afdal al-Sadqa." The greatest charity to a community is islah, is to reconcile between people, is to bring people together. In a hadith in Ahmad, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi called "Afdal al-Ibada," the greatest of worship is to bring the people together, to build amongst the people, to let that community experience its full productivity, even though you won't be celebrated for it. Because it's not about you. It's about something greater than you and greater than the two parties that are fighting as well. It's not about you. And you immediately should think in that capacity when things go down. How do I fix the situation without losing the core of it? without losing the underlying issue, how do I move this community forward in the most productive way? So I want to give you all an example, by the way. When we look through the history, the Prophet ﷺ called Al-Hassan wal Hussein. May Allah be pleased with them and their father and their mother and their grandfather. The Prophet ﷺ and their grandmother. The Prophet ﷺ called them Sayyida Shababi Ahlul Jannah, the chiefs, the masters of the youth of paradise. 
When we enter into Al Jannah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. When you enter into Jannah, the chiefs, the leaders of the youth of paradise will be Al Hassan wal Hussein. May Allah be pleased with them. Now, Al Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we know his sacrifice. We know the call for justice, the, out, the, the way that Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu was driven to be a voice for truth in the face of a situation where there were clear injustices and oppression. And the Sahaba that did not want Al Hussein radiallahu anhu to go forward did not disagree with his cause, admired his passion, but were worried about him. And were worried about whether or not Al Hussein radiallahu anhu would have the necessary support as he was calling out that injustice as he saw it, and if he would be able to achieve his goals, no one could question that man's heart, his passion, what the, the blood of the Prophet ﷺ in him, and that capacity that drove him to fight against dhulm, and he should be acknowledged and respected and celebrated and loved for that. We don't diminish al Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But do you hear about al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu as well? Not really. What he did is not as celebrated. Is not, and, and again, I'm going to say this again. Do not diminish Al Hussein radiallahu anhu with what I'm about to say about Al Hassan radiallahu anhu. Al Hassan, the other of the two masters of the people of Jannah, the youth of Jannah. You think of Al Hassan radiallahu anhu in history, most people cannot name the remarkable incidents of Al Hassan radiallahu anhu or what he contributed to Islamic history and what he was able to do for society. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving a khutbah. In Jum'ah. And Al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu walked in. And the Prophet وسلم, in the midst of his khutbah, he looked at the people, then he looked at Al Hassan, then he looked at the people, then he looked at Al Hassan again. And he said about Al Hassan radiallahu anhu, in Ibn Hadha Sayyid, this son of mine is a master, he's a leader. This son of mine is a leader. It may be that through him, Allah will reconcile two great armies from amongst the Muslims. Allah will bring people together through this son of mine, this descendant of mine, this leader, Al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. What did Al Hassan do? Al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when the Khilaf of Ali radiallahu anhu transferred to him, Al Hassan made peace. Al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu made peace between those two armies, the army of Ali, which was left over, and the army of Muawiyah. And in the process of going to the table, yes, Al Hassan had radiallahu anhu followers that loved him and that did not want him to do that. That, like those who told Al Hussein radiallahu anhu that we will be behind you and we will fight, told Al Hassan radiallahu anhu, if you decide to fight, we will fight behind you. But he saw the interest of the community different. And he had the most to lose by doing so. He is the Khalifa, giving up his Khilafa, giving up his leadership, choosing to go anonymous instead, politically anonymous instead. Al Hassan radiallahu anhu became politically anonymous after that moment when he hands over the Khilafa as part of a bigger treaty. And you know what that ushered in? The years of the golden age of the Ummah. The Muslim Ummah was able to focus on growth. Because it wasn't embroiled in fitna. Now most people when we look back, we'll see Islah and we'll see what, you know, Al Hassan radiallahu anhu will not get the praise of Al Hussein radiallahu anhu. Al Hassan was the hand of peace. Hussein was the voice of justice. May Allah be pleased with them both. They both had a crucial role to play. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted the community to particularly take note in that moment of what Al Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu would do. He didn't obscure the truth in the process. In fact, he tried to protect it. He did what he thought would protect it best. He moved the community forward in the way he thought best. And he was driven by the same thing that drove Al Hussein, which was Allah and His Messenger وسلم, and the benefit and the continuity of the community. They're both driven by the same motive, not by ego, not by themselves. Al Hussein anhu, did not want the praise of the people. Hassan radiallahu anhu did not want the money of the people to give up, to, to seemingly give up and compromise. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted us to take note what Al Hassan radiallahu anhu did to courage, make no mistake about it. 
That took courage. That took a lot to swallow, to go to that table and for the sake of the ummah, say, you know what? How do we move this community forward? How do we do what's best for the ummah at this point of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I want to end with this thought. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah has a narration from Isa alayhi salam. One of the aqwal, the sayings of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him. The sayings of Jesus peace be upon him come through Wahb ibn Munabbah and Ibn al-Qayyim and Abdullah Mubarak and Allah knows uh, it's, it's not through the rigorous uh, sanad of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but these beautiful sayings that existed amongst the ummah and were in our books of Tazkiyah. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah quotes that Isa alayhi salam said Tuba lil muslihina bayna nasi fi dunya May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or there's a valley of Jannah guaranteed for the muslihin for those that reconcile that bring people together that play that role of cement in communities in this dunya they are the people who will occupy manabir pulpits on the day of judgment in close proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ashabul manabir al muqarrabin people who occupy humble reconcilers, people who will occupy pulpits close to Allah. You know who else has that? According to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, people of justice will be on manabir, pulpits of light on the day of judgment. More vocal, more out there doing what they do. But those two acted out of the same importance, out of the same motive, out of the same agenda of pushing forth the community of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to that which is best for us and in guiding us to that which is best for us to utilize that for what is best for the community, to utilize that for what is best for the ummah, to utilize that for what is best for humanity and more than all of that, to utilize that for that which is best for our akhirah, for our hereafter and our Reckoning and standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to those pathways of khair and avoid or, or, or remove us from those pathways of evil. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li ulakum wa nisa al-muslimin fa astaghfiru innahu al-ghafur rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا واعف عنا ولا تعذبنا ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين اللهم إنك عفو كريم وتحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم اغفر لوالدينا رب ارحمهما كما ربونا صغارا ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم انصر المستضعفين في مشالك الأرض ومغاربها اللهم أصلح أحوال إخواننا المنكوبين في كل مكان اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والكاذبين ودمر أعداء الدين اللهم أهلك الظالمين بالظالمين وأخرجنا وإخواننا من بينهم سالمين عباد الله أن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على النعماء يزد لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Please make sure your lines are straight and there are no gaps between you. Allah Akbar. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصلى النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إنا أعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, dear brothers and sisters inshallah uh, tomorrow evening we will be having our second annual uh, banquet for Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research uh, we'll be joined inshallah ta'ala by Dr. Jonathan Brown who's a professor at Georgetown as well as director of research at Yaqeen Sister Dalia Mugahid and uh, brother Bashir Jones city councilman Bashir Jones this was the only person subhanallah we're talking about the wave of Muslim candidates around the country this man as he became the first Muslim in the uh, history of city council in Cleveland actually did takbir and the people shouted Allahu Akbar and you can think about how beautiful that is in terms of the confidence that that required and inshallah ta'ala tomorrow we'll be talking about what it means to make principled progress as a community and it will be an event inshallah ta'ala where we can really come together and, 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 and hear ideas from three very different unique perspectives about what it means to make progress with our full identity and each one of us finding that pathway to khair. So last year I gave the last khutbah at Epic before our banquet and we sold out before the khutbah was over. We had four seats left. This year alhamdulillah we have about 50 seats left from what I understand. So please do go ahead and purchase your tickets inshallah ta'ala and be, uh, be a part of it tomorrow inshallah. You can see the flyers um, outside or you can just go to yaqeeninstitute.org and purchase your tickets. But we'd really like to see uh, the epic community uh, come in epic fashion inshallah. Jazakumallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before uh, we uh, make our uh, announcements, I have a request for dua. Uh, I think we all know Brother Absar. Uh, we just found out that his dad is very sick. He is diagnosed with cancer. And uh, inshallah, his surgery is Monday. So I would like to request the entire community to please remember him in your dua uh, to make, uh, have a successful surgery and complete shifa for him, inshallah. Ta'ala. Also, um, Brother Fahim, that uh, you might know that uh, he was in our community. His father passed away in uh, New Mexico. His father-in-law has also passed away uh, in last month. So please remember all those who have left this world and who are sick. Uh, before, when you're leaving, please uh, donate to the masjid for the operation. Uh, as uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman, for the very intellectual, inspiring khutbah. Inshallah, we'll see him inshallah tomorrow. We have the opportunity to hear him again. And the fundraising, please support the cause for the Yaqeen uh, institution. Uh, as well as uh, we have uh, Ikna Muslim Day, uh, November 17th. I believe next Saturday. So please, uh, this is here in South Fork Ranch. Uh, please support the event. Zakal khair. Assalamu alaikum wa wabarakatuh.